Triangle Access Broadcasting, a non-profit corporation. W-R-L-Y, L-P, Raleigh. From Feature Story News in New York, I'm Sarah Walton. Fires near Europe's biggest nuclear plant led to it being briefly disconnected from Ukraine's power grid on Thursday. It comes amid growing concern about fighting around the Zaporozhye site, which is controlled by Russia. Another delegation of U.S. lawmakers is visiting Taiwan, despite pressure from Beijing not to go. And tennis champ Novak Djokovic has confirmed he won't attend the U.S. Open because he's not vaccinated against COVID-19. Non-citizens without the jab are banned from entering the country. Brought to you by Triangle Access Project. Broadcasting. Here's a look at the weather in the Oak 93.5 listening area. For tonight, mostly cloudy skies with a chance of isolated evening showers, low around 69. Friday, partly sunny and humid with a chance of isolated afternoon showers and thunderstorms. Morning patchy fog is possible, high around 89. Friday night, partly cloudy, low around 70. Saturday, partly cloudy and humid with a chance of scattered afternoon showers and thunderstorms, high around 92. And Saturday night, partly cloudy skies with a chance of scattered showers and thunderstorms, though around 70. Keep it here on Oak 93.5. I'm now cast meteorologist Jim Vaughn. Ladies and gentlemen, you're now tuned into Chat City with P. Ross. Conversations and interviews are in the queue. Listen or join in. Here she is. P. Ross. Greetings, 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 everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another show, Chat City with P. Ross. I am your host, P. Ross. And today in the studio with me, I have Pastor Tony McVickers of Rockfish Church out of uh, Rayford, North Carolina. Did I say that correctly, Pastor McVicker? McVic- Vickers. <laughs> All right. Pastor McVickers of Rockfish Church, Rayford, North Carolina, and Charlene Ross, activist and leader of TKO, The Pit Maneuver Killed Our Loved One. Thank you, too, for being in the studio with me today, <laughs> taking time out of your busy schedules to do this show. Now, um, for those of you that seen any previews or saw any previews of what we were going to be discussing today, uh, we have a tough subject or a stiff subject we're going to talk about, and it's one that's near and dear to my heart, and that is abortion. Uh, Before we get into abortion, though, we're going to discuss Charlene Ross's um, activism. And we're going to start with her and her um, telling us what, TKO, The Pit Maneuver Killed Our Loved One, is about. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a little insight into Charlene's story, and it's a brave one. Um, Her son, on June 29th of 2018, was killed in a car crash. And that crash uh, stemmed from a a chase uh, from a state trooper to Sean Quell, and it started at a checkpoint in which he chose to, excuse me, chose to flee the scene. Um, Charlene, I'm going to ask you to pick up the story from there. Okay. Um, It was June 29th. I received a phone call from my son, and he said, Mom, I'm in a high-speed chase. And so the drilling was flowing, and um, I said, well, Let's get to a safe area, and I'm going to meet you at the store. Um, The call dropped a few times, and he was saying, Ma, just get to me. So I could hear all of the sirens um, in the background. And then I said, "Um, just pull over. So he says, okay. So as he was proceeding to pull over, I hear a crash. I heard a loud noise, and I heard him make a noise, and I don't hear him anymore, and and I'm calling, and I'm calling him, pick up the phone, pick up the phone, and I couldn't get him anymore. So at that point, that was the last time that I would hear his voice. Okay, I'm very sorry about that, Charlene. Very sorry to hear that. And I know that must have been very hard for you. Um, so after that moment, um, can you share with us what happened next for you? Um, 
what happened next was that um, the news media would come immediately to my house the next day and was wanting to know what happened. Okay, but before the news media, can you tell us um, how did you receive the news of your son's fate after you did not hear, after you heard the crash? Well, my daughter, I was at the hospital waiting on him to arrive there, Mm -hmm. and he never showed up. And people were calling my daughter and was letting her know that it was a fatality and that it was her brother. And I was calling and I was told that he was on the way to the hospital and he never made it to the hospital. Okay. And so the after that point, what information did you get as far as what actually happened? Or did you hear that the next day through news media? Yeah, no, nobody called. Nobody showed up at my house to tell me what happened. Um, the next time that I would know what happened came from the news media. It came from Facebook. That's how I found out. Um, Facebook knew before I did about my son um, being killed. Wow, I'm sorry that you had to hear it that way, Charlene. Um, So when the media approached you the next day, what type of questions did they ask you, and how was your family handling everything at that point in time? Um, They asked me what happened, and I told them all I know is that I was on the phone with my son and that he was in a chase, and no one came to inform me of what exactly had happened until they told me that it was a pit maneuver that was used on my son. Okay. Can you tell us what PIT stands for? And break that down for us, please. It stands for Precision Immobilization Technique. It's when an uh, officer or highway patrolman takes his car and hits the person's car and is supposed to spin safely in an open field but in, in that case, it didn't happen. Um, it was no probable cause. It wasn't done in the open field. It wasn't safe to use. It was aggressive force. And the events that took place that night didn't warrant that type of aggressiveness that was used on my son. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so um, so the news media came through. Um, you didn't know what had happened actually, because no one had actually said anything to you, not as far as um, um, the State Highway Patrol. And when we say State state Highway Patrol, we are speaking North Carolina. Correct. Okay. And um, so they tell you what happened. What were your thoughts after that, Charlene, after they explained what happened at that site, at the scene? Um, my thoughts was to figure out what was this technique that was used? It caused me to ask questions because the media was so concerned um, about the events that took place. Mm -hmm. So it caused me to do some digging. I had to find out, I never heard of the pit maneuver before. Mm -hmm. So I had to do some research and find out what it was. Okay. And to your research and your finding, what did you discover? Well, in the policy and procedure, it states that um, you're supposed to be going a certain amount of speed, which was 45, 55. The officer was going over 90 miles per hour, and that the impact, my son was going 55. It's supposed to be used if there's a felon, if there was a robbery, if there was a murder. None of those things took place. Okay. All right. And did you discover any other findings or what other things did you find when you researched pit maneuver? Um, I found out that um, it wasn't done correctly. Okay. And that it need to, it, it's something that doesn't need to be in place. There was other alternatives that could have been used. Okay. Can you name some of those alternatives that sh- that you said could have been used? Uh, they could have 
called it off. A tag gives you information. It gives you a name. It gives you an address. Spikes could have been used. You're supposed to preserve lives, not take lives. My son didn't get a due process. Okay. All right. Now, um, this case was also considered a high-profile case. Uh, one, because it, it was state trooper involved. That's one. And the other, um, your son's grandfather at the time was an active mayor in a local town. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, so uh, there was a, I'm, I'm sure that's probably one of the other reasons why the news media flood your home and flooded you, you um, because of these things here. Um, what was it like, Charlene, for you um, and your family when they did come? Um, it was devastating. Um, we knew how to live with them, but we didn't know how to live without them. Mm -hmm. So everything changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Chat City with P. Ross. I'm your host, P. Ross. You're on, we're on Oak 93.5 FM WRLY Raleigh. We have in the studio with us today, Ms. Charlene Ross. She is an activist and the leader of TKO, the Pit Maneuver Killed, Our Loved One. And we also have Pastor Tony Vickers, in which we will be discussing abortion today. All right, now we're on Char We're discussing with Charlene her story. Um, Charlene, negative attention was placed on your family because of Sean Quayle's choices, um, eluding the law. I know that probably didn't make you feel uh, the best, but tell us how you handled this reaction from others. Well, you know, I had no choice but to to take it and and listen and everybody's entitled to their thoughts, their opinions. At the end of the day, that was my child. Mm -hmm. He was loved. Mm -hmm. He belonged to a family that loved and adored him. Um, to be on the phone with him and to hear somebody so scared, I never heard, mm -hmm. you know, anything like that before. Just to hear how frightened he was in his voice. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have stopped. Mm -hmm. But I am saying that it didn't have to happen like that. Mm -hmm. They could have called me. The car was in my name, so my name came up. They could have called and said, Ms. Rouse, hey, there's a car. Um, was it taken or anything, you know? Was it stolen or anything yeah, like that, right? When they looked at the tags is what you're saying. Right. Okay. All right. Um, now, you decided, Charlene, to um, take all the negativity stemming around your son's case and turn it into a positive light. Um, tell us how you reversed the situation. Well, um, I start getting out there. Um, news media start contacting me of the same things that had happened to other families. So um, in Ohio, I was contacted. It happened to this lady's sister, and they was calling to get my feedback, my take on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I just left Georgia maybe a few months ago, and I went there and did a protest there um, at the Capitol there. Mm -hmm. The same thing that happened to my son happened to another lady's son. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't warranted. And then the aftermath of it, mm -hmm. to see the damage was just that stuff alone, like something else should have been done. This woman's son car, the, the tire was in the sunroof. Mm -hmm. 
and my son is like the middle of this car was was gone and he didn't stand a chance but what bothered me the most was that when he hit that tree those officers got out of that car and drew guns on my son wow oh wow okay um now we're gonna kind of map fast forward this story a little bit and and get to the part where you've made the decision i'm going to reverse all of this and um have the pit maneuver changed into something or you you were working towards getting rid of the pit maneuver right and you started i think locally in your hometown with friends and family picket signs and you went before the local north carolina highway patrol offices with all those things uh about your son and yeah. your idea of eliminating the pit maneuver because it killed your son how did you begin this journey? I mean, I if I was to protest something, I I wouldn't even know where to begin. I mean, yeah. did you have did you research that as well, or just just tell us how you started that movement? I just started by first doing the research, mm -hmm. and then looking at um, their policies and their procedures, and then looking at the aftermath, and then what happened to my son. I'm like, Dave, this shouldn't happen. This should not be in place. Um, so I, I wanted to work towards getting it banned in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I started with the protests, like you said, in my hometown, and then reaching out to others and um, doing a lot of reading, and I found out that it was done a lot in North Carolina. Um, and then I found out, too, that in some states, they don't even allow it. They don't even use it. Okay. So if... They don't use it in these other states. It shouldn't be used anywhere. Okay, and, and have you discovered the reason why they chose not to use the pit maneuver in other states? Not really. The The reason um, is just that it was outlawed, and it was some um, cases where it resulted in, in deaths. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still working on that. Um, I'm just trying to get the bill passed. I just came up with some things that's... Um, that I just wrote the bill, so I have an attorney looking at it to get it written out so I can present it to the House of Representatives. Okay. Earlier you mentioned that some you felt there were some other uh, methods that the State Highway Patrol could have used during the high-speed chase with your son. Um, you mentioned spikes and things of that nature. Uh, could was spike, Are spikes used in other states that you know of or what other procedures yeah some of them sometimes they do use the spikes mm -hmm. um and then sometimes they just called it off it was this um one man this young guy they followed him three um towns mm -hmm. and he was given a chance to walk away with his life and he had carjacked and knives on my son didn't commit no murder he didn't do no bank robber he wasn't a felon none of that okay so okay. the simple thing to do would have been called it off okay and even you know if he went from like one town to the next town mm -hmm. uh, hey we have this car right here you pick it up you know just to preserve a life everybody deserves a due process okay now, you've had the opportunity to meet with the governor here in Raleigh. Is that correct? I did. Okay. Um, how did you prepare? That's that's huge. Um, how did you prepare to meet with our governor? I had the governor with the Zoom. I met with the House of Representatives and some more senators um, up in Raleigh, and I did a protest there as well. Okay. And so I just I, I reached out and called and said, hey, I want to come and talk with you to see what we can do about the pit maneuver. Mm -hmm. Let me let you hear my side of why it shouldn't be something like this in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they were willing to um, sit down and, and talk with me and listen to me, mm -hmm. but they didn't do 
anything. So recently this year, I reached out again to our Colonel um, Freddie Johnson back in in February. So I'm waiting for him to call me back. And you said that was your Colonel? The Colonel, um, yeah. He's over the North Carolina State Highway Patrolman. Oh, okay. All right. Um, were you able to speak with the officers that were on the scene that night uh, of your son's accident, Charlene? No, I wasn't. Okay. All right. Um, I'll tell you, you are very courageous in uh, doing this uh, this thing for your son. Um, and as you mentioned before, other families have reached out to you for um, your experience in this and what they had had to experience, sadly. Uh, tell us about um, your interaction with, with some of the folks that you've met that have uh, had to experience this as well, Charlene. Um. Well, we call, we talk, we met up, and the first thing was um, somebody's going through the same thing that I was going through. Mm -hmm. And to kind of prepare them, like, hey, you're going to get some backlash from this. You're going to do some things that you endure. Um, know your policy and your procedures because it's different. Mm -hmm. and um, those are the type of interactions that happen just to call and be a listening ear you know at times the one mother her name is Glenda and she was um, from Chattanooga Tennessee and it started down there at the Georgia line um, I met with her and we keep in contact now what started at the Georgia line uh, chase with her son. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. And so you met with her in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee? Yes. Okay. We went right. to Georgia and we met down at the Capitol and I facilitated that protest on behalf of her son as well. Okay. So not only are you trying to get that pit maneuver banned here in North Carolina, you guys were working as a team to get it banned in Georgia as well. In the whole United States. The United States. Wow. That is, that's huge. That's real huge. All right. So, um, you've decided to write a book, My Life with you, Without You, A Mother's Journey Through Grief and Loss. Uh, you penned and published this book after Sean Quayle's passing, and you give details about your son's death. You share photos, and you also uh, you also penned a couple of poems, you and your daughter, concerning your son's absence here on Earth. Tell us about that. Um, my daughter and her brother, uh, so, so close. And, you know, we don't know how to grieve. You're not taught um, how to grieve. You just do the best that you can. So um, one day I got home and I um, would find like a envelope or paper towel. I started writing thoughts that was coming in my mind. I just started writing. And then after a while it turned into a masterpiece. It turned into a book. And... Um, Symphony, Shanquel's sister. She's also she's a writer. Um, so she's she's written some things about her brother. Like I said, they were uh, really really close, and I thought I was gonna lose her one time <laughs> because mm -hmm. of it, it. It it really devastated us. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we went to the doctor and they asked her what was her brother to her and she said first he was like my father my best friend then my big brother mm -hmm. wow Ms. Ross thank you so much for coming in and sharing your story um, I know it's not easy to do 
but you definitely deserve a house applause on that and a shout out to symphony your daughter um i know she's been by your side through this whole ordeal and you two have been doing a wonderful job keeping your heads up high uh, I, like I said, I can only imagine how it's not easy for you, but you guys are really um, uh, doing it. I mean, when I say doing it, you are uh, doing well with this situation. So, again, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Those of you that are just tuning in, you're listening to Chat City with P. Ross. I am your host, P. Ross. We're on Oak 93.5 FM wrly raleigh as i mentioned earlier in the show we are going to discuss a topic that's very near and dear to my heart um and that is abortion pastor tony mcvickers of rockfish church rayford north carolina has come on the show here with me and he's going to help me <laughs> through some of this stuff pastor mcvickers thank you again for taking time to come Okay, I don't hear you for some reason. Hmm. Hold on just a second. Make sure your mic is turned on. Okay, oh, everything's there. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Pastor McVickers, are you there? Okay, hold on. I still don't hear you. Forgive us. We are having technical difficulties. Yeah, you can, uh, okay, if you could do that, that'll be good. Give us a moment here. We want to make sure you hear Pastor McVickers loud and clear. <laughs> oh, the button got hit. Okay, there we go. All right. Testing, testing. Pastor McVickers, are you there? Is that better? Yes, All that right. is much better. We're going to give you a house applause. Right. <laughs> As I said earlier, uh, 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 abortion. Um most recently, our country has been turned upside down because our Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, that was a, a landmark decision that protects a person's constitutional right to privacy in choosing abortion. Pastor and McVickers and I have not met until today. We spoke brief briefly by phone. I was told of him by a mutual person that we know mm. i'm going to give a shout out to that person mr keith at the barbershop there in southern pines north carolina right. and that's how he connected me to pastor mcvickers but we talked briefly and we both uh are pro-lifers i would say fairly is that correct that's correct all right so uh what is abortion abortion is a procedure to end a pregnancy and you can end that pregnancy through medication or through a surgical procedure. Pastor, I was born in 1969. Mm. How did our country get here in 1972 legalizing abortion? Mm. You, you know, there's there's been a dramatic shift. Uh, you, you said something earlier about the protection of a constitutional or turning over of a constitutional right. What the, what the Supreme Court decided is that it's, it's not a constitutional right. It should have never been there in the first place. It was decided by the courts. It was decided by, by the courts so that it could bypass the legislation that was taking place in every state. The people overwhelmingly had rejected legalized abortion, so it took the Supreme Court coming in, usurping the will of the people, in 1972 uh, it was not up for vote at that point the only way they could get it passed was was through the courts and in doing so it created a riff um, that has lasted until literally the overturning of, of that decision right now judges aren't elected by the people therefore often they don't represent the the, the mass the, the majority of the people which is so ironic because the cultural shift, the, the epistemology, the thinking of the United States and the, and the people of the United States has so changed mm -hmm. uh, leading up to the 1972 and even to now. There has been a drastic change. It, it's not that, and I want you to catch what I'm about to say concerning, because abortion is, is, a, is a fruit of another issue. Mm -hmm. But what has happened is it's not that we just disagree on things. That What has happened is you've got people who think 
differently. Mm-hmm. So there's been a change. Uh, there's been a, the adopting of a different paradigm of thought. Epistemology is kind of the, the process or the thought processes that we choose. But the epistemology of our nation as a whole, people-wise, has changed and has made a dramatic shift. One from, um, from what we would consider... Um, a, a biblical worldview or a Christian worldview or a uh, one that acknowledges a creator to uh, what we would call a atheistic worldview or a humanistic or materialistic worldview, one which excludes, excludes the idea of God completely. Mm-hmm. And when you adopt that thinking, it changes everything, it changes how you think about things, it, thinks, it changes how you process, and it obviously changes the conclusions that you come to. You know, when we talk about abortion and we talk about, I'm, I'm just very, uh, very clear. God is pro-life. The mm-hmm. Bible is very clear. It says thou shalt not kill. It's, mm-hmm. That's one of those. I can mess up a lot of things theologically, but that, that one's pretty clear. Uh-huh. Um, interesting. You know, I, I am, I applaud. I am so happy to hear. And I, I celebrated this and I, I caught a lot of flack. But when I think about 60 million babies that have lost their lives mm-hmm. and, you know, we can say it's the ending of a pregnancy, the reality and, and truth is that which aligns with reality. Reality is a baby dies every time there's abortion. Right. If an abortion is successful, it's never successful unless it takes the baby's life. Mm-hmm. So in a nutshell, I, th- I think that abortion is the, is the fruit of a bigger problem, a way of thinking, a deviating from a, a biblical worldview and in the embracing of a humanistic worldview. Okay. Now, to me, it's simple. I mean, we get here through pregnancy. We enjoy life, a lot of us. <laughs> worldwide nationwide um so how one doesn't understand that a fetus or embryo is all a part of becoming an adult right i and you terminate that i mean i don't understand so here's my question i mean i think a a lot of us know about pregnancies right um and if we don't understand the human anatomy and how we get here, I mean, where do we start? Right. Do we start sex education at home? Do we start it at school? Do we start it at church? How do we explain life and what, how life is started and, and how, I mean, you know, well, you want to preserve life. <laughs> I, I think it goes back to, again, it's kind of a way of thinking. And mm-hmm. if we're going to be intellectually mm-hmm. honest, I, 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 I created and made a TikTok video and asked mm-hmm. this question. Uh-huh. If you absolutely knew that it was a baby, would it make a difference? Mm-hmm. Now, wh- what do you think the general consensus was? Um, if you absolutely and, and scientifically and otherwise, what we, uh-huh. we do know, the, the, the very definition of, of conception if you look at, if you pull out a dictionary right now and you look at conception, uh-huh. it, literally the definition, the scientific biological definition of, of conception is the, s- the beginning of human life uh-huh. r- or hu- the beginning of life, whether it's a, a, a bird or a turtle or, a, or a, a fox or a dog, conception is the beginning uh-huh. of life. Um, uh-huh. we, we know biblically from a biblical worldview that when a, when a child is conceived in the womb, it's not only conceived you know, with a soul and a spirit, it's also conceived with a destiny. Uh-huh. We see that very often that God, John the Baptist, in the, in, in the womb was leaping in the presence of, of Jesus Christ. They, uh-huh. they, they carry that, that plan of God even before the womb. I, uh-huh. I, I, call it the, I call it that magic six inches where in our minds somehow we're able to delineate between it's a baby here and it's not a baby here. It, it's mm-hmm. foolishness. Right, but the reality, right. when I asked the question, if it, if you knew it was a baby, would it make a difference? And the overwhelming consensus of those who were pro-abortion said, no, it wouldn't make a difference, which, which leaves us with one conclusion, mm-hmm. that they're okay with killing babies. And I am diametrically opposed to that idea. I am not okay. Um, one of the big... Um, things that we hear well what if the mother's life is is uh, in danger mm-hmm. that is in our day here in america in this context it is unheard of with uh, the ability to to uh, perform c-sections and those things and uh, this is not my opinion mm-hmm. this is um it, empirical documentation from previous abortionists have said v- never 99.9 percent of the time uh, you know, the the woman's life is not at stake. Right. Uh, you know, even you, you hear about well, tubal pregnancies, all of those things. Well, it's not viable. It's not going to grow. It would never. It would never live anyway. Uh, that natural process would take care of it. But the but it, as far as a pregnancy that would cost the mother's life at any point, 
at any point you could you could perform a cesarean. Okay. So now what do you do with the people that says, uh, what about rape or incest? They do not want to have a child by someone that had raped them or right. have and, a child by their dad. Yeah, okay? and th- th- this is where the epistemology really comes in. If there's uh-huh. no final judge and no final authority, in other words, if man decides what's right and what's wrong, fine, then no problem. None of this is, all of this is a moot point. But if there is a God, two wrongs don't make a right. You know, when we looked at what David did, uh, you know, it did <laughs> covering up by killing another. Where, what other area does a child, do we kill a child for the sins of the father or the sins of the mother? It doesn't apply. Right. You just don't see that. Mm-hmm. When in those cases, and, and I, I would concur this, and here's where, here's where the cards really are played on the table. Mm-hmm. Because if you ask somebody very often who is pro-abortion, you say, okay, I'll tell you what, if we, if, if would you say absolutely in the case of incest and the case of rape and in the case of, of uh, the detriment to the mother's to the mother's safety, would you be okay to say other than that, no abortions? And the answer is always absolutely not. So, mm-hmm. so that's something they throw out honestly. Uh, mm-hmm. If they're intellectually honest, it th- that is, it's just not the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it, there's if, if I would be willing to say, you know what, at that point, I, I, to save how many. When we talk about the percentage of those, it, but what we really have to ask is, is that less than 1% of abortions for, performed in those cases, is that does, does that justify the 60 million? That is one-eighth of the entire population of the United States. One-eighth of the population. So we, mm-hmm. we have a workforce problem right now. <laughs> let, me, let me explain <laughs> something. It's about to get really ugly in America because you can't make these immoral, and that's what it is. It's immoral. You cannot make these immoral, anti-moral choices without experiencing the repercussions in reality. Mm-hmm. See, truth is that which is consistent with reality. The reality is if you kill 60 million babies, it affects the nation. It is detrimental to a nation, and we're seeing it, and we're mm-hmm. going to see it even more and more. Right. I know of just several people that have survived um, Mm. cases of incest, I will say. Um, And I when I'm trying to make my point on this pastor, I'm like, you know, hey, give that person, give that baby a chance to figure it out. Yes. Don't make the decision for the baby. Mm. You know, you were able to work out some things for yourself. Give that baby that same uh, opportunity. And most of the time, I mean, I, I, and there's been debates with me and other people about, well, you know, that person's on drugs now or whatever, you know, right, I'm like, uh, right. that's, I don't believe that's the case all the time. Right. But, uh, you can become an over, uh, overcomer of drugs, you know? Absolutely. So, uh, just give that person a chance. I hear people make mm-hmm. the argument, well, if mm-hmm. it's poor, uh, okay, well, that's, that's, <laughs> That's mm-hmm. half of us. I grew up poor. <laughs> right. So there's a monetary value or a standard of living that we assume when we say, okay, that person wouldn't, wouldn't want to live. The interesting thing I find out is everybody that is pro-abortion is alive. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So, I'm a, we're going to just house applause with you just said. Everybody that is pro-abortion is alive. Yeah. So why would you want to take life from an yeah, yeah. Take I did, away life. I asked a question. This is going to blow mm-hmm. your mind. This is, I, I asked my congregation. I, I had three services. We were doing three services at the time, and I asked the congregation. I said, everybody who is willing to take a child into their home, I want you to stand up. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, who, who would who would literally stand in the gap to save a child's life? Eighty percent of our congregation in every single service. Mm-hmm. Uh, stood up and said we would take a child and they mean it we've had in 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 rafer just with the pro-life efforts that we've made there's been 13 babies saved two of them are running around the church right now adopted by f- a family in the church yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. so but I, I guess here's what it comes down to and and I'll, I'll just be very candid i'll be as gentle as i can with this when we adopt a, a attitude or a mindset that says all that we are is something that evolved from from matter plus chance plus time, uh, which is what the only thing that's legally taught in our schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, theism is not an option. It is e- the courts again have made it illegal to teach theism. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- they've uh, they've said the only thing that you can legally teach is a 
theism or mm-hmm. secular humanism or materialism. When you have no purpose and you have no meaning, which is what you do, which, which is what happens when you do away with God, then none of this matters. Mm-hmm. Then you know what? You can kill babies and say, you know what? It was inconvenience for me. It was a bad time for me. There was a, The baby was not going to be uh, smart or maybe it had a, a deformity. But when you adopt a, theo- a theistic worldview, then humans have intrinsic value. What happens is there was an incredible effort in 1972 Mm -hmm. to dehumanize fetuses. And Mm -hmm. so they called them by stages. Do you know what the word fetus means? It's it's baby in another language. Uh You know, but we we say something to dehumanize it. And they showed pictures in the super, super, super early stage to make it look like something less than a human. Mm -hmm. Uh, Later on, they showed they showed picture after picture after picture that scientifically validated that, you know, that this is a baby. It is, it is viable. But then they said, well, it's a baby, but is it a person? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've, we've seen in history where they've done that, where we dehumanize people, whether it was the Jews, they dehumanized them and said they're less than humans. And once you take away the intrinsic value, the imago Dei, the fact that we're all made in the image of God, we are image bearers. That's where our our value comes from. Mm -hmm. And to throw away a life, period, mm-hmm. becomes something. Now, I know there's justice, and I know there's time. The Bible is very clear when, when there's a time to take a life. Um, but an innocent life, God does not look kindly on the shedding of innocent blood. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an atrocity. It is, I call it, I, I call it a, a, a holocaust mm-hmm. of, of insanity that we've been enduring since 1972. I was born in 1972. Mm-hmm. I, I made it. Mm-hmm. I made it. Praise God. So, so the the most dangerous, <laughs> the number one killer of, of children in our in our in our nation is not cancer or tumors or child abuse or car wrecks. It's it's abortion. It's abortion. There's there's not even a close second. But when the most dangerous place on the face of the earth for a child is the mother's womb, there's a moral there there's a moral depravity, or a, a, a worldview that has taken ascendancy to deprive someone of even seeing their own child is valuable. And, and I know this may sound harsh, and I know there's women out there who have who have had abortions. And listen, my heart goes out to you. There's forgiveness, and there's mercy, and there's healing. Right. But there's a child's life that has been taken. If you saw what was done, and everybody said, well, don't show pictures. Don't let it see. Out of sight, out of mind is what's happened. Mm-hmm. It is a horrible. There is no circumstance, no situation under which that child does not feel the same pain it would feel outside the womb. That's terrible. It is. It's a, it, It's horrible. Those of you that are just tuning in, you're listening to Chat City with P. Ross on Oak 93.5 WRLY. We have in the building with us today Miss Charlene Ross, an activist, and Pastor Tony McVickers, a pastor. Uh, a topic that I wanted to touch on today was abortion. Uh, I am a pro-lifer, and so is the pastor, Pastor McVickers, and I'm thankful that he's able to explain and communicate some things that I feel like maybe I couldn't have done as well as him uh, on this matter and on this subject. And it's one that's very important to talk about. Um, Pastor, uh, there are people that say, well, you're taking away a woman's right to her body. You hear my body, my choice. Right. Speak on that. Well, <laughs> there's uh-huh. another body involved. <laughs> <laughs> Simple, <That's>, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it's not just that people say, well, it's an organ. Well, you can pull out your appendix. You can pull out your kidneys. You know, uh-huh. that's fine. You pull out the wrong organ, you die. Uh-huh. Um, in this case, one, again, people say Hitler did it. He said something over and over and over until people begin to believe it. But here, here's, the, here's, here's the deal. Uh-huh. I said, truth is always that which is consistent with reality. Uh-huh. A lie is that which is not consistent with reality. With reality. You can remove the child, and if the child is, and, and we know that we can save babies at tr- tremendously, uh, much much more early than we could before. Mm-hmm. So a child's ability to be viable outside of the womb is much, much greater than, you know, th- than what we initially thought it was. We've come a long ways. Uh, but l- looking at that and, and realizing that we can use any type of semantics that we want. L- let me let me put it this way: mm-hmm. my body, my choice. Does does that give me the right to take my body to take to to take your money? No, it's my choice, right? <laughs> right. Well, it is, but there's consequences <laughs> associated with those choices. Uh-huh. Well, does it give me the right to take the person's life setting next to me or anybody else's? You have suffered through the loss of of your son. Uh, so when when somebody's life is taken and there's an element of injustice associated with it, there is no no ultimate justice in an atheistic world. 
a, a theism or the belief of God tells us that there is ultimate justice. And if there is justice, there is no escape from the reality. According to the word of God, innocent blood is crying even now. And I'll just tell you, our nation is, is covered with innocent blood. And mm-hmm. people can disagree. But what I'm, what I'm saying is consistent with reality. Mm-hmm. Every one of us are here right now, and we're talking or we're listening or we're having this conversation, guess where we were? That same thing that was there at conception is now here. That's like saying, well, it's not a baby yet. Okay, well, then a toddler doesn't stop growing. When we look at the stages, is there a difference between between the embryo embryonic stage and the full gestation? Because if there's not, then there's no difference between the gestation and the toddler right. and the toddler and the teen. And we look at that, and the only difference is it's veiled you know, by a few inches of human flesh. Mm -hmm. The reality of it is that is a child that is growing with its own heartbeat, its own, its own thoughts, its own feelings. That's why moms, I I remember praying for my child in, 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 in the womb. When we say it's whether a child is valuable or not, it's up to the mom Mm -hmm. or it's up to somebody else. Let me me explain something. A life is valuable, period. Right. Amen to that. I'm going to give that one a house for life. If you have any questions for the pastor or even Ms. Ross, uh, our activist, feel free to call into the station at 919-899-9305. Again, this is your opportunity to call and chat in with us at 919-899-9305. Pastor McVickers, let's touch on uh, Planned Parenthood. Mm. Do you know anything about Planned Parenthood? Uh, oh, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge those. <laughs> and, and I'm going to expose some things. One, okay. you, you know the history, I'm guessing, since you brought it up with Margaret Sanger and uh, all this. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, population control has always been the that from the roots of this, this wicked organization. And I'll call it that because I'll challenge any of you. One, <laughs> I, I want you to cleanse your mind. Put on your put on your your filters and go to Planned Parenthood mm-hmm. and look at what is represented. It is pure pornography. Mm. It is garbage on their Facebook. Go to their Facebook. Mm. You will okay. be sickened. Well, as I went through the Facebook and I, ch- I challenged people to go look at what they had, I, I can't even talk about it on air. It is so explicit. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, what does this have to do with women's health care? Well, also something else that I noticed was a, a large prevalence or, or a relationship between the LGBTQ community and Planned, ha- Planned Parenthood. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going, why? Because let's just let's look at this. Generally, if you're engaged in those type of lifestyles, you're, you're not going to end up pregnant. Homosexuality doesn't doesn't turn into procreation. It just doesn't happen. That's right. why that's why in reality, I say a lie is always exposed by reality. Mm-hmm. Um, sex is for pleasure, yes, but it's also for conception. Mm-hmm. In a context where that can't happen, it should tell you nature itself says this is not right. And that is perfectly consistent with the Word of God, which is always consistent and viable in reality or in this world. Needless to say, I go and I see this connectivity, and I realize they are pushing these types of alternative lifestyles, which is what they call them, these alternative lifestyles right there on Planned Parenthood, where they're also uh, destroying babies. What's the correlation? Both have to do with effective population control. When people are engaged in same-sex relationships, they don't reproduce. That That's one type of population control. The other population control is destroying babies. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, wow. And then it took me a minute to kind of have the epiphany of going, why are they so pro this? Mm-hmm. Well, both tend to population control. And they target particular cultures uh, and particular um, particular vulnerable people in, in, our, in our society. Mm-hmm. Now, there's an, uh, um, a preacher by the name of Gino Jennings, Apostle Gino Jennings. I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, but he's a very controversial uh, pastor that's in Pennsylvania, and he has cell churches, I think some in North Carolina and in other places. Uh, he touches on um, Christians uh, should not believe in abortion, and he pretty much says if you're a Christian uh abortion you, you you need to be both pro-life but he also says that you're a hypocrite if you're bombing and blowing up abortion clinics which you have some people feel that they're doing it hmm. uh 
in the name of righteousness right, and that right. type thing. Let's talk on that a little bit. Well, let me point out something along those lines. Mm -hmm. One, I don't think Christians should ever turn to violence as long as there is a as, as long as there is there is an option, an option to run away. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that the Bible does say Jesus said, you know, sell your sell your stuff and get a sword if you don't have one. I'm not saying he was necessarily saying violence, but we should be able to defend ourselves. But let me point out something. Uh -huh. Over 40 pro-life clinics have been attacked since the announcement of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Now listen to this, 40, over 40. Do you, do you understand, take a guess, how many people have been prosecuted in those attacks? Mm. Zero. <laughs> Zero. Uh -huh. Zero. Now, now, I'll, now I'm going to show you a double standard. The FBI took five weeks to respond to the one that was ab ab absolutely destroyed in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. They took five weeks to respond. They have video evidence, and there still has been no prosecution. However, let's flip that over. There was a Planned Parenthood where somebody lit a log purchased from a Lowe's outside the building and caused minimal damage to the Planned Parenthood. FBI came in immediately and traced that log and the purchase of that log to a person and prosecuted that person within five days. There is a double standard. There is duplicity there. Mm -hmm. Here's what I don't understand. And, and, and maybe somebody who, who is, is pro-abortion can help me. Why would you destroy? You say you're pro-choice. Well, wouldn't you be for a mother's choice to actually keep the baby? And that's mm -hmm. what those clinics are for. Right, right. They're trying to help women who need help and are in desperate situations. Why would you target one of those clinics mm -hmm. when they're there just to help people who have chosen? You're hurting the moms that you say you care about. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute false dichotomy to say that you can't care about mothers and care about babies. Mm -hmm. You can. That's why we have adoption. I, I would love to see adoption taken out of the hands of the state. I'd like to see babies and moms, moms and prospective parents put together before it ever got convoluted through the through the system. And, and that can happen. And we're working on a program for that right now. Mm -hmm. But we have have an opportunity to step up and really make a difference. And, and I believe that churches not only are willing, but we're capable of connecting that need if we can just save those babies. Right. Now, there was a Facebook uh, debate going on. I kind of took part in that debate some time ago, and it was uh, a person that said she was a pro-choice person, and she said that, um, well, if um, why don't I can't remember verbatim what she said, but her point of view was this: if we've got all these thousands of babies that are left in these um, orphanages, what are you pro-lifers doing about? saving those children you know yeah. and so uh that solution that you just made is uh i think would be one yeah and there's that we could look at and there mm -hmm. are more families waiting on adoptions right now than there are children available mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. and and it would w let me just say this wouldn't it be a great problem to have if there were if there were more children that had lived and weren't murdered you know you look at that and I, the rationalization is is mm -hmm. is scary uh you know if if a if someone's perspective or someone's convenience or someone's value of a child is what determines the value, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been times when I'm sure my mama didn't want me, <laughs> want me around, <laughs> and it was after 1972. Uh -huh. uh, but but what if my life was contingent upon my mom's convenience? Yeah. I, I just I, that that it mortifies me mm -hmm. uh, because I've, I've, we're not. Fortunately, as believers, we see we see through a heart of compassion and we also see through a heart of reality according to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. But life is valuable. And, and because America, I'm just going to be honest, has walked away from, from acknowledging God, then it's purposeless. We all evolved from pond scum somehow. And you know what? We have no right to have hope or to have joy or love. These are all constructs that don't even exist mm -hmm. in reality outside of a, a theistic worldview. I have a statement that I want to read um, by Lenny Bruce White. And his statement was this. If Planned Parenthood was killing puppies instead of babies, America would shut them down oh, by now. Come on. You, you, uh, <laughs> you, you go crush sea turtle eggs. You go crush sea turtle eggs. You right. will go to jail, especially in California. You crush sea turtle eggs. There, uh, a sea turtle egg has uh -huh. more protection than uh -huh. babies. Yeah. Work. With, tell me the logic. It uh -huh. is failed logic. Our president, uh, Joe Biden, leader of the United States, made this statement um, shortly after the Roe versus Wade overturned. And uh, 
his statement is was this it's a sad day for the court and for the country the court has done what it has never done before expressly take away a constitutional right that is so fundamental to many americans speak on that pastor uh, first of all it was determined that it was not a constitutional right and it mm -hmm. absolutely wasn't it should have never been passed it is not alluded to anywhere in the constitution in fact if you look at the constitution we're guaranteed the right or at least in the preambles preambles of the constitution to what life liberty, liberty and, and the, the pursuit, pursuit of happiness, happiness. if yeah. you don't have life you are ripped you're you're taken completely out of the even the mental construct of the Constitution. So to hear him say that, uh, it just just kind of blows my mind. But there, but but let me let me throw this out at you. Can mm -hmm. I give you? Can sure. I can I up that? Let me. Up, sure. I know we just got a minute. Mm -hmm. There's a pastor in Georgia mm -hmm. who is who I saw the video. I was disgusted. He had um he had he was a child dedication on Sunday and had these children lined up with the parents on the stage and then he began to to talk about how horrible it was to take away the right to abort their children. Now, th this is a pastor, mm. and I, I'm just going to tell you, I, 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 don't, I didn't contact him. I'm not going to say his name here now because, you know, I, I will be something I, I'm not going to talk about him if I haven't talked to him. Mm -hmm. That's a Christian thing to do. Mm -hmm. But I would say that pastor and any other that has the audacity to, to twist the Scripture into something that validates aborting children I call him to repentance in the name of Jesus. It is deplorable, and it is a sick twisting of the Scripture. I will challenge him. I will challenge anybody who has that perspective. I will debate them according to the truth of the Word of God, and they and and expose it for the foolishness that it is. I, I'm telling you, it's one thing. This is one thing the church should be united on. Mm -hmm. If you say that you're a believer and you're not pro-life, I need you to help me understand. Thou shalt not kill is pretty doggone simple. Mm -hmm. I, I just, that's... A no-brainer for me. Right. Me too. Um, we are coming to the close of our show. Um, Charlene Ross, uh, we mentioned your book earlier in the show. Um, tell us the name of it again. My Life Without You, A Mother's Journey Through Grief and Loss. Okay. And if one wanted to contact you and talk to you more about your fight uh, against um, the pit maneuver, how can we reach you? I have a website set up called TKO the Pit Maneuver Kills dot com. Okay. TKO the Pit Maneuver Kills dot com. And will they be able to get a copy of your book from that website? Yes, you can. Okay. All right. Pastor McVickers, um, let's say you see a mother standing in front of an abortion clinic. She's alone. What words would you say to her? Uh, this is actually a scenario that that we run into all to all the time. Mm -hmm. That there is hope and there is help. There is hope and there is help for you and your child. There is hope and there is help, and we are willing to put our money where our mouth is. We're willing to help and instill hope not only for you but, but for the future of that of that child. Okay. And uh, I just want to add, um, there are solutions to abortion, uh, against abortion, uh, not using that as a choice. One, abstinence. Oh, Amen. That's a choice. Okay. That's a good choice to make. <laughs> Two, your body, your choice. <laughs> um, birth control, whether it's condoms or birth control pills, that's another solution. And um, two, uh, adoption. Pastor McVickers. Thank you for coming to the show today and helping us with this thank you uh, for subject me. here. Thank you. Thank if you. one wanted to talk to you more, how can we contact you? Send all of the hate mail to <laughs> <laughs> uh, rockfishchurch.com is our, is our website. That's rockfishchurch.com. Okay. Um, and anything there as far as contacting us or whatever, is, it, it, it's all there. Um, and, and I know we've, I've, I've said some things that are very pointed and very clear, but this is a very black and white situation but uh, you know again I, I, there is forgiveness and there is hope for those who are considering it and those who have had abortions jesus loves you mm -hmm. he's willing to forgive if you're willing to ask amen charlene do you have any last words for us today real quick and i believe in um fighting for what you believe in you have a voice use it mm. amen that's good all right, that is the close of our show. Thank you for listening to Chat City with P. Ross. 
Please tune in again next Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. You can watch us on Facebook on Oak 93.5, or you can listen with TuneIn app. Again, Pastor Matt Vickers, thank you. Charlene Ross, thank you. And best wishes to the both of you. Thank you. From Linwood, this is WRLYLP Raleigh. From Feature Story News in New York, I'm Sarah Walton. Fires near Europe's biggest nuclear plant led to its last two working reactors being disconnected from Ukraine's power grid on Thursday. The site at Zaporozhye has been occupied by Russia since March, but is still run by Ukrainian staff. The reactors were reconnected after being disabled twice. It comes amid growing concerns.